computer. <laughs> Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to hit a difficult topic today uh, on uh, healing. It's not a difficult topic for Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Do you know that 20 years ago, I started seeking the Lord on this one topic because I saw so many people dying of diseases and robbing them of their life earlier than I felt like was the God was God's heart and will for their life. And so I started traveling in Africa. I was with Rex Crane and I saw whole churches get healed of diseases. We don't see people getting healed of here in America. And he is the one that set me on this course of learning from Holy Spirit everything about healing divine health on the earth as it is in heaven. Um, so I just want to thank my mentor and best friend Rex Crane for putting me on that, um, that, uh, Trajectory. pathway. Um, also I had some great teaching from pastor Mike Webb at Foothill family church in Southern California. He used to run with, um, Kenneth Hagan and every Sunday night he had healing school. He only taught about healing in his church. And I just want to thank him too. Mike Webb, you started a lot of this in my life. Thank you so much. Also, I want to thank uh, Chuck Perry. Chuck yes. Perry has taught us more about healing than probably anyone he's demonstrated the joy um, of the gospel, the joy of the gospel, the, the power of God. You know, that's what we're assigned to do is to demonstrate the power of God. Yeah. There's supposed to be something that happens when the power of God shows up. It doesn't always we uh, happen the way we think it should. But when God shows up, things happen. Oh, but you're here. Oh, but Jesus, you are right <laughs> here. You know, no matter what we see in the healing rooms, Paul, um, Paul uh, well, he's kind of like Paul, but Chuck <laughs> will say, he will remind us, but Jesus is right here. Yeah. Sometimes we need to remind our body of that, you know? Okay. So I want to dig in. We're going to start in Genesis chapter one. <laughs> Did you know healing is on every page of the Bible? every page. Um, I just want to challenge you to find that. I want you to go through the Bible and look for the healing power of God on every page and to be convinced that it is his heart to heal you. If you're struggling, it's his heart to heal your family member. If they have a disease, if you haven't seen success yet in that area, keep pressing on. And if you know somebody that's died, um, that shouldn't have died, somebody of great faith. Let that be the fuel for you to press on, to press on. They're in heaven cheering you on right now. They're saying, please bring heaven to earth. Please get this. Come on, keep pressing on, okay? So we're gonna start in Genesis chapter one. What does it say? Oh my goodness, You're this is gonna blow your mind, my friends, I think. <laughs> He says already, Genesis chapter one, verse 28. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. We have not had a hard time doing that, multiplying. <laughs> but this is where we got it wrong. Fill the earth and subdue it. What does it mean to subdue it? I thought the earth was perfect. Why do we have to take violent force and subject the earth under our authority, our God-given authority, our identity of, as sons and daughters of God? Why? Well, that's another topic and I'm not going to discuss it right now, but Teaser. Teaser. it's a very good, it's a very good topic. I'm just going to give you a little hint when the Bible says God created the heavens and the earth, the very first verse of Genesis chapter one, there's a period there. Something happened between when he created the earth and when he created man, something happened, but that's another subject. And I, I just 
ask you or challenge you to ask the Holy Spirit about that. I might te teach on that one day. But anyways, what does the word subdue mean? Let's look it up. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> subdue means it is quite a word. It means to subjugate by military force, to bring under control by physical force persuasion or other means to overcome the very first thing that god said to us is that we are overcomers we had something to overcome we have something to conquer there is something to conquer and it was the lies of the enemy the enemy was already here in the earth he was already trying to steal our identity from us. He was already trying to put us under subjection of him. But God is saying, don't let that happen. Put everything in subjection to you. You're my son. You're my daughter. Go and subdue it. Now, you can look that word up in Hebrew and you will find it has the same violent kind of language used. It's like, take the kingdom of heaven by violent force, right? Those will take the kingdom of heaven by violent force. It's the same um, that we see in the New Testament. Okay, so now let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah 9, chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Look up that word peace. Find out everything about peace that you can. Of the increase of his government and of peace. Oh, I'm sorry. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. Okay, so when Jesus came, he brought a kingdom with him, and it's a government system that will increase forevermore. It started when he came. He had to restore it. It came first through Adam. Adam gave it away. Adam gave his authority away in the garden to Satan. He gave the keys of the earth to Satan. Satan became the God of this world. Jesus came to restore us to having the keys and to be in authority, but it was going to increase over time. So of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. Do you know that Jesus taught on the kingdom of heaven more than anything else? Why? Why did he teach on the kingdom of heaven more than anything else? Because his whole idea was that God's heart was to give you back the keys of the kingdom and that his government would be increasing would keep increasing. You would discover more of who you were. Every year of life, you would discover who you actually are. You are his son and daughter, and you have the same authority that Jesus had on the earth if you get into the subduing idea of taking, uh, of taking authority over the works of the enemy, okay? One of the works of the enemy is sickness and disease. That is a work of the enemy is never God's work. So a lot of people think, well, what about this in the Bible? God gave this sickness and God did that. I want you to know that Jesus came to give you God's perfect heart to show you his heart because Moses got it wrong a few times. Job got it severely <laughs> wrong, okay? A lot of people think Job is so wise. I heard someone a few weeks ago, he's the wisest man ever. I'm like, absolutely not. He had a lot of good things to say in chapters one through 37, but God comes on in chapter 38 and he goes, basically, you're an idiot. He literally says, what do you know? <laughs> Were you with me when I created the earth? No, you know, Job said a lot of good things, but they were half truths. Half truths make a truth false. Okay. We got the, we got the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Whenever you mix good with evil, you have evil, right? We've been eating from that tree. We need to start eating from the tree of life, right? 
So my friends, I hope you're with me. Are you all with me so far? Yes. Yeah, okay. So his kingdom was designed to have an ever increasing uh, um, uh, uh, effect on the earth. And he's going to do it through you. Jesus started it. He brought the key. He got, he, he died to get the keys back. He was the perfect sacrifice to stop the curse and to get the keys of the kingdom back. And he left those keys with us. God is going to increase in his government through you. This is why Jesus preached on the kingdom more than anything else. He said, he told his disciples, when you go heal them, tell them the kingdom of heaven came near. Tell them the kingdom of heaven has come upon them. Beautiful. Why? Because the governing system of the kingdom had a manifestation in the physical realm. And he wanted them to know what happened because their current experience in the physical realm was not of the kingdom of God. When somebody is sick, lame, blind, impoverished, they're not having a heaven experience on earth. Can we all agree with that? Can we find cancer in heaven? No. Anything that you find in heaven is God's will. That's why we can never say it's the will of God that you have this disease. It, that's that's a lie my friends we will not find disease in heaven it's not his will his perfect will is being played out right now in heaven and he is praying for you every single day that you'll get this um where am i going here let's see um i just want to prove to you that you're increasing in your knowledge of the kingdom of god in order to subdue the earth again, as we were first commanded to do. You know, God doesn't command you to do anything you can't do. He didn't command uh, Adam to subdue the earth because he, he was going to have to strive and struggle to do that. No, he commanded him because he could do it. It was something that Adam could do. He was subduing something that was broken. He was taking control over the earth. He was taking ownership over the everything that belongs on earth again that's another subject but we'll get into that another day but this is the same thing we see right now is god is praying for it, it says jesus intercedes for us every day why is he interceding for us every day he wants us to grow in our knowledge of the kingdom of god to the point where his kingdom manifests in our life. He wants the kingdom of God to be on earth. This is why when the disciples asked him to pray, what did he say? He could have said anything, you guys. He could have gone on for chapters and chapters and chapters of prayer, <laughs> right? He could, have, he could have given them an hour-long session on praying, but he just like very simply, if you just pray for this, you're going to start growing in the increase of his government. He knew that. Okay, look, he said, he said, pray thy will be done. Whatever's in heaven is God's will. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He wants heaven to come to earth. He wants heaven to be here. He wants us to have a heaven experience on the earth. He wants all of creation. This set, It says this in Romans chapter eight, that all of creation is waiting for you yeah. to be revealed, a son and a daughter, that all of creation, the rocks want to cry out and praise God when you walk by. They want to, the all of creation wants you to be revealed. Why? It's when very you're narnia. revealed, very it's narnia. very narnia. <laughs> When you're revealed, when the true you is revealed, you will be just like Jesus and you will bring back the glory of God in the earth. This is what God wants, the increase of his government. There's two systems, the government system of the world, Satan is control of that, and the system of heaven. And they're not like this 
at all. They're not in competition. It looks like that sometimes, but only because we've been fighting the enemy face to face and we were never meant to fight him face to face. We were meant to fight him from above, above him. We were meant to look down on the enemy and, and command him, go back to hell where you belong. Get under my feet, trample scorpions, every enemy, trample them. That's what we were meant to do. Okay, look at this, you guys. We are growing in our faith every day. We're growing in our knowledge of this every day. And the more we have knowledge of this, the more it will manifest in our daily lives on the earth. Um, you have been given, this is Matthew chapter 13. Um, I recommend everyone to read all of Matthew chapter 13. And I believe it's Mark 4. Um, about the sower and the seeds and how they increase and all of that, just get a, a, three translations of it and then go on a word study with God um, to find out what God meant by this. But this is in Matthew chapter 13, verse 11. You've been given the intimate experience of insight into the hidden mysteries of the realm of heaven's kingdom, but they have not. I'm going to read that again. You have been given the intimate experience of insight into the hidden mysteries of the realm of heaven's kingdom, but they have not. He was telling his disciples that there are levels of learning and he only spoke to people how they could hear him. This is why he spoke in parables to some and to others. He gave them the secrets of the kingdom, because when you've been given the secret to a kingdom, you now have responsibility, right? Yes. To respond to it, to act according to it. And he knew that those that could only handle parables, they couldn't obey a word of depth because they didn't have yet the ability to know and to, to subjugate, to put their body underneath their spirit because their body was speaking too loud. They were perhaps soul, soul controlled, not spirit controlled. He was helping his disciples to become more and more spirit controlled instead of soul control. What they saw with their physical eyes, they needed. He was helping their spiritual eyes take precedence over their physical eyes. Mm -hmm. And this is what he's saying. He goes, for everyone who listens with an open heart will receive progressively more revelation. So what is the, what is the um, requirement? To have an open heart. Every one of you has an open heart, my friend. No one, no one of you is misqualified, disqualified. If you're reborn again, You've accepted Christ as your savior. You have an open heart. Now, this is the thing. I just want to stop here and interject. There was a time when God told Abraham, leave your family, leave your father's house. Do you know it wasn't so much about a place as it was about a system of beliefs. He had to get away from his father's way of doing life, his father's belief system and he had to leave that in order to gain and grab a hold of the promises of God yes. and he was very integral in getting God's grace to the earth and to to make God's grace known to the earth so you this is you like it, it's almost like God is saying and my friend Lindy Ann called me this morning and she goes Annette I got this word this morning move or die and I was like, what? Oh my gosh. I wrote it down. And I was like, that's really ministering to me right now, because literally we have got to move or we will die. Move mm -hmm. on from our old belief system, move on to our small thinking, move away from this doctrine, this box of doctrines that we've grown up with, yeah. that it's the will of God for you to be sick. It's the will of God for some to be sick and some to be healed and some not to be healed, move away or die. Oh my gosh. Or, or we will be, what we'll be doing is we will be, we'll be um, cultivating a death mentality. Yeah. And I think my favorite um, description of that by Bill Johnson is 
when people when people think God gives them sickness for a reason, or he he says we have a schizophrenic God, a schizophrenic Father that's right. one moment loving us, right. one moment disciplining us. No, right? That, like, and he doesn't it. use a tool of Satan, which is sickness and disease, to teach you a lesson. He will never pick up a tool of Satan. Satan is the destroyer, not God. And this is how Job got it wrong. Job thought God was the one who took away. This is why we sing that song. I don't sing it, but this is why many <laughs> sing it. I the don't. Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but blessed be his name. No, 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 no. That was Job said that you are quoting Job and Job got it wrong. Job thought God took from him. Satan was the one who stole from him. Satan was the one who was the destroyer, not God. When God came on the scene, what it, what happened when God came on the scene? He got what? 10 times more than he had before. Okay. God is the blesser. God is the only capable of blessing you. He is only capable of healing you, of loving you. He is only capable of treating you the same way you would think of being treated in heaven. In the perfect place. Heaven is perfect because we have all left our old belief system. And we're finally in perfection. Also, I want to bring up that we're going to finish this verse in a second, but the Bible says in Hebrews that Jesus is the author and perfecter of your faith. He is continually perfecting your faith. That means we don't have a perfect faith, right? He is perfecting our faith every day. He is the author of it. If we would just turn to him and say, Jesus, teach me about that. He'll give us the answer. He is delighting to give us the mysteries of the kingdom of the heaven. He is delighting to share every mystery of God's heart with you. If we have an open heart, it says we will receive progressively more revelation. Um, then he goes on to say, this is still Matthew 13. We are now in verse 12. For everyone who listens with an open heart will receive progressively more revelation until he has more than enough, more than enough uh, for what? <laughs> for overcoming every enemy of the, of uh, God. Amen. Okay. Uh, but those who don't listen with an open teachable heart, even the understanding that they think they have will be taken from them. Whoa. Okay. Open heart is really important here. Um, why doesn't God just put his put his uh, ways on us and, and make us? Because he wants partnership. He wants relationship. He wants you to be involved in bringing his kingdom to the earth. And this is a real relationship. He is not into being a puppeteer. Right? He's into having a real relationship with you. He's invited you into the more of God, mm -hmm. to more revelation, more mysteries. He wants you to have more than enough. Were you going to say something? No, I'm just okay. I'm just agree. <laughs> okay. Uh, even the understanding that they think they have will be taken from them. That's why I teach the people using parables because they think they're looking for truth. Yet because their hearts are unteachable, they never discover it. Although they will listen to me, they never fully perceive the mes message I speak. Um, okay. Uh, da, da, da. And then he goes on, just read this whole chapter. Uh, at the end of uh, verse 15, he's quoting Isaiah. He says, I've, um, let's see, da, 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 their minds are dull, slow to perceive. He goes on to say, um, then otherwise they would open their eyes to see and open their ears to hear, and open their minds to understand. Then they would turn to me, and I would instantly heal them. Uh, did you know that the word healing, uh, in the Hebrew Jewish mind, there's no such thing as spiritual healing? No such thing. It's only physical. He means physical healing. And this is why, my friends, because God doesn't heal your spirit. When you got reborn again, you got a new spirit. You didn't get an upgraded one, a healed one. Uh, you, you didn't get a, a changed spirit. You got a new spirit. You were reborn. 
You got the spirit. You got a cleansed, perfect spirit that intertwined, that's intertwined with the Holy Spirit. You're one with Jesus right now. But the problem is, is our spirit man is perfect, but we got to train this. We got to train our soul, our soul to be subjected to our spirit. Do you know, Paul says, um, he says, I subdue my body and get it under my control so that after preaching the good news to others, I myself will not be disqualified. He tells people, I put my body under subjection of my spirit. And this is what we've failed to do many times is our body is screaming. It's screaming with um, physical realm realities. You're in pain, you have disease, it's screaming, it's a real thing, it's really happening. But what we need to do is we need to remind our bodies that Jesus is right here. Mm -hmm. Every time pain happens in your body, talk to your body and tell it the truth. Your body is living a half truth. We're in this realm, we're learning, we're, we're at the, the kingdom of God is ever increasing in us where our spirit man wants to take charge, but we've given charge to our soul, our feelings, our emotions, our thoughts. This is why we take every thought captive and we make it obey Jesus. This is why we take every imagination and we cast it down. If it sets itself up against the knowledge of God, what is the knowledge of God? It's whatever is in the kingdom of God is what we were supposed to experience on earth. My friends, this is God's, this is Jesus himself. His prayer is that the kingdom of heaven would come crashing through this, this realm and this physical life and experience, he's going to do it through you and through me, through people. This is why he told his disciples to pray like this. And he wants you to pray like this. He wants the kingdom of God to get to your body. He wants the kingdom of God. He wants you to have a heaven experience in your physical body. Now, I, there's so many places I can go with this, your physical body. But again, I have 10 hours at least of, of training on the subject of healing and we only have an hour. So, <laughs> um, so you're going to have questions and this is the thing you have the Holy spirit. You have the Holy spirit. And if you ask him, he will tell you, ask him to take you on a journey of more and more revelation in every question you ask him, ask with an open heart and an open mind, and he will fill you with it's unbelievable how much he wants to to teach you about this it's uh, it to me it's just unfathomable almost that he wants it so much more than i want it the kingdom of god to actually be manifested on the earth in your life this is why he said the kingdom of god has come near to you then he said the kingdom of god has come upon you and then he said kingdom of God is within you. He wants the kingdom of God, the governing system mm -hmm. of heaven to be filling your brain with truth, not half truths like Job. Job had half truths. He wants the kingdom of God to fill your mind until that is your reality. Till that reality becomes your reality here on earth. Okay. Um, let me look and see where I was going to go before um, we started talking about this. So Genesis three, this is where we lost our identity. This is where we lost our identity to be conquerors, more than conquerors. Um, those who were subduing the earth, remember the definition of subdue. Mm -hmm. It's violent. It's not a fun, easy kind of a word. It's not a feel good word. It's a conquer. Yeah. Look it up, look it up in the Hebrew as well. Um, 
We don't yet have perfect faith. God is perfecting our faith. Jesus said, I am the author and perfecter of your faith. So we are all on a journey of discovering more and more of the kingdom of heaven, the truth. We're all on a journey to allowing our spirit to be in control of our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, so that our brain will then release the right chemicals to our body and create an environment environment where our body can heal itself. God made your body to heal itself. Yes. Isn't that amazing? He made it that way because he knew what you were going to face. But friends, the, the problem is, is we have been soul ruled. We have been ruled by our thoughts, our imagination, um, this realm. We get our information by what we see here but we were supposed to get all of our information by fixing our eyes on Jesus and, and looking to the throne room of heaven. And that's where we're supposed to get our information. That's where we're supposed to fill our brain with the truth of God. What's happening in the throne room is supposed to be happening in you. And God is not mad at you. If it's not happening, it's not happening in my life perfectly. God is perfecting my faith every day. But this is the thing. We haven't arrived, but we are arriving. We have left the building, right? We haven't arrived to perfection yet, but we left the building. Um, whenever we got born again, we left that building. We are like Abraham. We are leaving our old ways behind. This is why Jesus said, some of you are going to have to leave your father, mother, brother. You're gonna, it's going to seem like you hate them. Because you're going to embrace Jesus and they're going to hate you for embracing Jesus. You got to leave your home. You have to leave your old system of beliefs and your family carries that system of belief. You might have to leave your own family for a while. Now, this does not give you um, permission to leave your husbands or anything like that. No, this is really um, just an example of Jesus saying you're going to have to trade in your old belief system for a new one. You're going to have to, every time the enemy comes and says, oh, but what about this? Did God really say, uh, you know, <laughs> every time the enemy comes and says, but so-and-so died. So maybe it is God's will for you to have sickness, disease, impoverishment. Okay. This is the same thing that happened in the garden. Satan came and said, did he really say did he really say you were in made in the image of God? Did he really say to subdue the earth, to take it by force and to conquer the earth? You know, if Adam had walked out his purpose, Satan would have been subdued. The enemy would have, it, he was already under Adam's feet, but he, he, Adam, Adam was tricked. Eve was tricked into thinking they weren't who God said they were. And this is the same thing that's going on today, my friends, is we have been tricked into thinking that we can't subdue the earth, that we can't bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. We have to wait till we get to heaven one day, then we will experience um, all the things that we want to experience. No, God is praying for you every day. Jesus is interceding for you every day that you would get this, that you would start on this pathway of going from glory to glory. This is his will for your life that you go from glory to glory. If you're in a lot of pain right now, don't condemn yourself. No one is condemned who is in Christ Jesus. Do not just start speaking the truth over your body. Yeah. You know, you might be in pain right now, my friend, but we're going, we are on, we have left that building. <laughs> we are on our way to embracing the truth of God. And my friends, this is so important. Important. This is one of the most important besides salvation. This is it. This is the centrality of the gospel. And let me tell you why, because sick people are rarely doing anything on the earth. Yeah. Your body's They're, used to bring the kingdom on earth. Yeah. You're, you're rarely doing anything. Uh, you're not, you're not fulfilling your mission, your, um, your assignment on the earth. And this again, do not receive condemnation here, but, but start being um, someone who takes it by, by force. Okay. You have been given an authority over this sickness and disease in your body. 
Okay. And, and we, sometimes we accidentally partner with the sickness and disease. We start coddling it. We say, oh, we start saying, oh, I have put the disease in there. I have, no, you don't have, you're being attacked by that disease. You don't have that. You're being attacked by a, a foreign um, principality or it, it, it does not belong to you. And you have been given the authority to take charge over it. And it might look like a slow progression of healing, but hang on, do not lose hope. Do not let the devil rob you of your healing. And this is why my friends, when I was watching Chosen over the weekend, it made me very, very uh, sad. Yeah. I want to say mad, but I was <laughs> sad because- it was. 90 percent of the church believes this theology that God has given you this this disease to teach you perseverance, to teach you um, whatever, to teach you a lesson. But no one would ever do this to their own child. No one. If you did this to your child, you know what? I know I can help you, and but I'm going to keep you in this position of. Um, pain and suffering because, you know, I can trust you with that. Yeah. No, you would be put in jail if you subjected your own children to pain and suffering and you could help them, but you didn't, you would be thought of as an abuser. And my friends, never is it God's will for you to be sick. <laughs> never. There is it. God never has ever, the sickness and disease is a tool of the enemy. He never picks up a tool of the enemy and works it into your, your life so that you can learn a lesson. Do you know the Bible tells you how God teaches you and disciplines you? It is very, very simple, my friends. He washes you and cleanses you with the word of God. Yes. The word of hope, the word of the gospel. He cleanses you and he teaches you. He disciplines you by giving you the word of hope, the love of God. He that's how God disciplines you. He doesn't, he's not the punisher. You are no longer outside of his family, living under punishment of the God of this world. The God of this world is the punisher. Mm -hmm. Okay, my friends, I, like I said, I have so much to say on this, but how I learned a lot is I just got into Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, and I underlined everywhere that Jesus or the disciples healed someone, and I learned from Jesus himself. Jesus is perfect theology. He never withheld healing from one person, ever. If you can find one verse where Jesus withheld uh, healing from someone, only one, then there might be some doubt in my mind. I might, I might think, but the Bible says wherever there are two or three witnesses, can you find two or three? No, you can't even find one. There's not one place. And Jesus came to earth. Remember, Jesus came to earth to set everything straight. He wanted you to know the father. The father was being blamed for stealing, killing, and destroying. Job blamed God. Job blamed God. He said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, but blessed be his name. He literally blamed God. And I can prove to you that in the very beginning of Job, he still did not trust God. You know, a lot of people think, oh, he's so righteous because of what Job said about himself in the first chapter. Um, he, do you know, Job was, he was, uh, having multiple sacrifices. He was giving multiple sacrifices to God for his children because his children were so disobedient. He thought he did, he, he went way above the requirement of the law. The requirement was one sacrifice. And I don't know how much time would go by before you'd have to do another sacrifice, but the requirement was one, but Job was like, Hmm, I better do a lot more sacrifices because my kids are so bad. Do you know what? That's a sign of, he didn't trust the goodness of God. So now he's got to really earn his favor and he's going to go sacrifice more and more. He didn't trust the will of God or the, the goodness of God. God only required one sacrifice. He was already in this 
this thinking that God is not good, that invited Satan to come in and steal, kill, and destroy. It said, the Bible says that the light, the Satan is like as a lion. He's not a lion. He's as a roaring lion. Why is he impersonating a lion? Because Jesus is the lion of Judah. He wants you to think that God is angry at you. So he's roaring at you. He is he is yelling at you, you stupid idiot. He's yelling at you, right? He wants you to think that God is mad at you. That's why he goes around like a roaring lion. He's just impersonating Jesus. And he says he's looking for who he may destroy. Now, if there are those that he may destroy, then there are those that he may not destroy. And that is you, my friends. I'm going to proclaim that over you right now. You are people who may not be destroyed. <laughs> Come on. Let's close the door. You are those who may not be stolen from. Let's just say that. You shall not pass. <laughs> right? You shall not pass. Okay. So there are also, okay, where do I want to go with this today? I have so many notes, my friends. Have to do do a I... part two and a part three. Part. There's going to be 10 parts to this. I have so much on this. Also, my friends, regarding the kingdom of heaven. Remember, let's just review. This is the thing that Jesus preached about more than anything. Why? Because his government is increasing every day more and more if his government is increasing through us we bring his governing system to the earth we allow his governing system to invade our brain and our emotions we no longer react to persecution we respond how do we respond with faith hope love joy we treat our enemies with love and respect. Hmm. We are operating in the governing system of the Lord Jesus Christ when we do that. We are living from the kingdom of heaven, not from the kingdom of this world. We're not living in response or in reaction to this kingdom here on earth. We are acting, we're supposed to be spirit controlled, Romans 8, read the whole chapter and memorize it. Um, we are supposed to be spirit controlled, not soul controlled. Our soul, mind, will, and emotions is supposed to be under subjection to the spirit. Your spirit, Holy Spirit are one. Your spirit was supposed to put the information in your brain so that you would think the thoughts of God. Now, when you think the thoughts of God, now, none of us are perfect at this. We're all being perfected, right? Our faith is being perfected by the author, Jesus. We were all meant, when, when this happens, when, when we are filling our brains with truth, perfect truth, and we're not letting this contaminate that perfect truth. What happens is your brain releases the perfect chemical. Yeah. It, and your body becomes an environmentally good. It's a, it's a good environment. It's a, well, it has it's a frequency. A, yeah. There's a frequency, it's a frequency it's a, like an ecosystem yeah. and your cells are designed to live forever. Do you know that scientists have already come out and said that makes sense it does death sense. is the curse and the curse is right broken. yeah god or jesus took the curse on the cross with right so this is it's so funny scientists are going wow we've discovered that in the perfect environment cells live forever we have no idea how this happens but <laughs> well <laughs> we do we know so my friends you have been given the gift of loosing and binding. Loosing on earth what is already being done in heaven. Whatever you loose in, on uh, earth has already been loosed in heaven. You have the gift of binding. 
Whatever you bind on earth has already been bound in heaven. What are you binding? What are you subduing? Let's, let's remember that word, subduing all of the works of the enemy. All of the works of the enemy. Every work. Every enemy trampled under your feet. What are you loosing? You're loosing a new governing system. And every day that you experience pain, my friends, let that fuel you into loosing more of the truth of God. You speak to your pain and you go, but Jesus died and by his stripes, you were healed. Speak to your body. Your body can hear you. Your body can respond to your voice. Your body responds to your belief system. Your body responds to joy, to the kingdom of God. It responds. If a rock can respond, then your cells can respond. <laughs> Amen. Come on. If a rock, something as dead as a rock can respond to the presence of Jesus, we need to bring the presence of Jesus back on the scene in our bodies. Okay, I think um, that's enough for today, my friends, but we're going to go into question and answer time because you have so many questions and I have a lot of answers, not all of them, <laughs> but you, let me just, let me just encourage you right now. Um, you don't need me. <laughs> you have the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Holy Spirit is the perfect teacher. And I just read to you a little bit ago that he wants to give you progressively more revelation. He wants you to receive this. He is interceding and he's praying that you'll get more and more every day and go from glory to glory to glory. He wants you to progress in, in your knowledge of God. He wants you to progress in your experience of God on the earth. He wants your experience on earth to be just like heaven. And that is his hope. He's always wanted the kingdom of heaven to be on earth. He wanted earth to be subdued. Genesis chapter one started way back then. And Satan robbed Adam of his ability to subdue the earth. And Jesus got the keys back. He got, he, he got the keys to the kingdom of heaven back for us, his sons and daughters. And this is why Romans chapter eight says that all of creation is waiting in eager anticipation for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed why do they want you revealed? Because when you know who you are and when you walk in that revelation of who you actually are, guess who benefits? All of creation, the grass, the trees, the animals. The animals are restored to the way God meant for them to be, the way God created them good. He created the, them to be good and perfect and pleasing. In fact, you know, uh, Romans 12, 2 says that when your mind is renewed, you will be able to prove the perfect, pleasing will of God. He had something. He has an assignment for you. Your assignment is to prove his good and perfect and pleasing will. What is his will? Everything you find in heaven is his will. If you can't find it in heaven, it's not as well. You can't find cancer. You can't find sickness. You can't Amen. find disease. You cannot Amen. find broken relationships. You cannot find brokenness, impoverishment. You cannot find any of that in heaven. Why? Because in heaven, God's perfect will is being done. And that's what he wants for earth. And that's what he's hoping you will get a hold of. And you will manifest the kingdom of heaven in your life. When are you making a film about this? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my friends, you have questions and I want to answer there's, them. There's a big question. That's a big question. When do you, an, uh, when you do answer questions, um, I would like to know how to talk to others specifically about um, the chosen, the scene. chosen scene. Yes. Uh, yeah. That chosen scene, their sickness was being validated and they cried during the movie. Yeah. 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 Releasing a lot of emotion and relief that God sees them, loves them and will still use them. Okay. Um, I'm, 
I can't read all of that, but okay. I have four friends with stage cancer uh, right now. Okay. Thinking of them and those. Okay. So this is why Laura, that I got so sad in, yes. are you still on Laura? I'm going to go into uh, this view right here. Um, yes. Laura is still on. Okay. This is why I was so sad, Laura, because anyone in the theater that has cancer, they are going to lose their fight when they hear this. Now, now I don't think Dallas Jenkins did this maliciously or um, intentionally to hurt anyone. 90% of the church believes like this. Um, but this is the thing. What, why it made me so sad is because there's people that are right now fighting for their life. They're hanging on by a thread. Their friends and family are taking them to Jesus. They're praying over them. They're doing everything they can, right, to help them. And then they hear this emotional scene that is so convincing. Convincing. You're like, oh, oh, Jesus, he finally has an answer for us. Oh, the Father trusts you with this sickness and you're going to give more glory to God because you have this sickness. My friends, sickness never brings the glory of God. Sickness doesn't, isn't God. It's not a part of his plan for you. Sickness is an enemy and it's attacker. It's attacking you. Treat cancer like it's your enemy. Not like it's a part of you or part of God's plan or his heart. Treat it like it's an enemy because it is. Okay, so you've had, you have a child with cerebral palsy his whole life. That cerebral palsy is your child's enemy. Any parent would know that. This was not God's plan for that child. Don't treat it like it's your friend. That doesn't mean you abuse the child that's being attacked. No, you love that child into wholeness. You know, you may never see uh, that child restored on earth. You may never see that. That does not mean it's God's will. Um, I have seen a child with cerebral palsy be healed in Africa. So I have seen it happen. Now, this is the thing. Um, Let's go back to the scene. I'm sorry. I wanted to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a few stories that are going to really uh, activate your faith, my friends. You're going to go from faith to faith, glory to glory. Mm -hmm. um, the chosen scene. He also quotes Job. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away, but blessed be his name. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus would never say that. The, the, Jesus would never have said that because Jesus was exposing the one who was taking away. Yeah. He exposed Satan. Do you know, like, think of it. This is, this is a study. This could be a study for you that rarely in the old Testament is Satan mentioned rarely. Then Jesus comes on the scene and he talks about the devil. He does. Why? Because so many times in the old Testament, they had attributed um, things to God that actually Satan was doing. So Jesus comes on the scene and he shows us the perfect will of the father by how he lives. He's the perfect. Um, uh, he is, he said, me and the father are one. What you, how you see me is, is the father, right? He was setting people straight mm -hmm. as as who the father actually was and who the destroyer was. Who is the one who steals, kills, and destroys? Who is the one that killed Job's uh, wife? Did God really work with Satan and give him permission? Was Satan really in heaven asking God these, these questions when he had been cast out of heaven? Or was that just Job talking? <laughs> think about it my friends god comes on in chapter 38 and says what do you know you are seeking counsel from unwise people you are seeking counsel from your own experiences why don't you ask me you know jesus set it straight he did not say god takes away no he revealed who takes away Satan is the destroyer. He is the one who wants to take from your life. And how does he do it? 
through the mind, will, and emotions. The truth is, is Satan can't hurt you. He can't harm you and he can't kill you, but he yeah. can get you to kill you. It's so interesting because Job is used so often. Yeah, Job is and always it, and used. It, and it, and it, I just thought of this. This is kind of funny because it's like, it's a heist of theology, you mm -hmm. know, a heist, like the Italian job and his name is Job and it looks like job. So it's like a, a job was done over through the book of Job on theology that keeps <laughs> everyone suppressed. Yeah, yeah. And under this false framework of belief system, you know, of sickness right. and accusation and you know yeah, being stolen yeah. from and taken from it, it it and it's and i believe this season this time in the earth that is going to be exposed so my my declaration Praise over chosen is that it is released out there so it can be exposed so it is in the light because it was so out there oh. it was just plain out there and someone here is saying um I wonder if Dallas was trying to cover for God when people aren't. Here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That that could be it um, for sure. Uh, because we, when people ask us these questions, instead of pointing them to uh, Jesus or saying, you know, ask the Holy Spirit that we, since we don't know the answer, we just go, we come up with our own, right? Our own answer. And because it is, it is so sad to see uh, the Benny Johnsons of the world die. And we're like, well, it must be God's will because she's a godly woman. And, and yes, she was. Um, but again, remember everything that I talked about today was the ever increasing knowledge of the kingdom of heaven. It, we are increasing in our knowledge of the kingdom of heaven. Why? So that more of his government can increase on the earth. Yes. Have any of us arrived? No, but we are arriving. We left the building. We are getting there, my friends. But this is the thing. If you if you take a hold of that theology that you saw in the chosen, you will create doubt in you and you won't go after uh, the kingdom of heaven with yeah. violence, with force, like with subduing force. You won't do it. You'll be like, Oh, that's God's will. Yeah. You know, and even before Benny died, Bill would address this all the time. He would talk about how we, he doesn't bring his belief system of healing down to his experience. Mm -hmm. he, the bar is the word of God. Yeah. He healed all. Yeah. Okay. So we have, do we have some more questions? Just a good word, Melissa. <laughs> Thanks, My Trish. goodness, you are so very encouraging to me. Okay. Um, okay. Ask me some questions. There's so many of them. What about the thorn in Paul's flesh? Do you want to ask that question? You guys, how's that? I answer it. <laughs> <laughs> what about it? Okay. Let's look at the thorn in Paul's flesh. So glad you guys asked. Um, the Bible shows you exactly what that thorn was. Was it a sickness or a disease? No. It was a messenger sent by Satan to buffet Paul. Mm -hmm. It didn't say it's a sickness and a disease in Paul's. In the very next verse, my friends, it tells you what the thorn is. Read it for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Don't ever take anything from you. Got you and Holy Spirit can can get this. Um, it tells you exactly what Paul is talking about. He is being persecuted from every side. Remember, Jesus said you're going to be persecuted. He didn't say you're going to be persecuted because that's the will of God. Though the, the will of God is not for you to be persecuted. He said you're going to be persecuted because he has a foreknowledge. He knows. And he wanted to equip his disciples before they go, go through it because he wanted them to act, react to all of the persecution with faith instead of just letting it, you know. Uh, defeat them. So this is a messenger from Satan sent to buffet Paul. Why does Paul, why does Satan want to buffet him? Why does he want to take him out? Because Paul was getting just a few verses ahead before all of this, Paul was getting revelations. We've talked about revelations growing in revelation. He was getting revelations from God that were going to cause more of the kingdom of heaven to show up. Just read it so that I wouldn't get, um, I, I don't know the exact wording, but just read all of that for yourself. 
Ask the Holy Spirit, what did you mean by this? Was that comma supposed to be there, Holy Spirit? Because that changes the meaning of scripture a lot. I'm going to give you an example in a minute. Um, so the thorn in Paul's flesh is a persecution. Now God comes back and he says to Paul, but my grace is sufficient. Is God saying, you know what? You're just going to have a little bit like enough grace to get by in life to uh, barely make it. That's what a lot of people think that's saying, but actually, can you imagine God in Paul having this conversation and God is going, cause he's talking about all the persecution that Paul is having to endure. He's going, Paul, <laughs> do you remember that time when you got put in jail? And I sent angels to get you out. And then the jailer, oh, that was Peter, but but everyone got saved because of that. <laughs> Wasn't that cool? His grace was more than sufficient for Paul. His grace came through an angel and got him out of jail. Okay, so what about Paul when you were shipwrecked? What about that time when you got bit by a poisonous snake? Wasn't that so funny, Paul? Oh my gosh, all of those people watching, they started believing. <laughs> yes, I mean, there's victory on every side of Paul's life. And everywhere Paul is persecuted, God comes in and shows up. And so many people get healed and saved and delivered. And, and even when Paul was in jail, he was writing the all-time best-selling <laughs> books in the entire world, so the true. history of the world. He wrote the best-selling books while he was in jail. <laughs> it's almost like God is coming and saying, my grace is way more than enough for you, Paul. Look at all these miracles that are happening. Oh, wait, what about the time you were stoned to death? They killed you, Paul. <laughs> then I resurrected you and you got up and you went into the city of the people that, uh, that stoned you to death and you preached a sermon right in front of them. And they're like, damn, yesterday. Wasn't that <laughs> awesome? <laughs> I mean, my grace is so sufficient for you, Paul. That's how God was saying, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. It's more than enough. <laughs> Come on. Okay. Give me another question. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> Come on. Do you guys have other questions? Uh, let's see. Um, okay. What about if you guys can't come up with questions, I'll come up with them. <laughs> I've been <laughs> you had them all in the healing rooms over the years. I've had a lot of uh, let me just say uh, a lot of pastors come to the healing rooms and they'll take my class. And um, I had this one, this one Lutheran pastor came and he was a pastor for 40 years and he was sobbing and crying mm -hmm. after class. And he was an older guy and he go, he was crying like a little baby. And he goes, Annette, he goes, I have never heard this before. How did I miss it? How did I get it wrong all these years? And I just held him and hugged him. And I said, well, look, <laughs> you can still take it right now, you know, and I just encouraged him and like, there is no condemnation <laughs> for those who are in Christ Jesus. We're all being perfected. None of us is perfect right now. He's perfecting our faith. Thank God. Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Thank God. He's working to get us to think like he thinks. And to respond to the earth the way he responds to it. That's what repent, repent means anyways. To yeah. think like he thinks, to think higher. Like when I was a kid, I was always like, oh, repent. I've done something wrong. Like mm -hmm. feeling lots of guilt and shame. And it's like, no, just think higher. That's okay, beautiful. we have a question. No, we have Sarah. a statement. We have a Constance. statement. I want you to read and interpret all the Bible stories, Annette. <laughs> so much joy in life. Well, <laughs> She is writing a worldwide curriculum, just so you know, so you can continue to pray for her as she brings that forth into the earth. And I'm sure she will be telling Bible stories in that. Oh, okay. Okay. So I think I know what scripture you're talking about. Thank you for that statement, Constance. I think I know what you're talking about, Sarah, when Paul is teaching them um, and they're, they're taking communion, right? Is that it? Uh, First Corinthians 1130. And he said that some, correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, because I don't have my Bible turned to that, but he's telling people um, some fall sick uh, early. They, they fall asleep early. Now, when you're a Christian uh, and you die, 
it's considered falling asleep. That's what, what we would say, right? So, and he goes, some misjudge the body of Christ. And that's why they fall asleep early. That's why they, they leave this earth early. I believe this is my opinion, but I want to um, just uh, give you uh, permission to disagree first, but to ask the Holy Spirit, what did Paul mean by that? What I think he meant, and this is what I feel the Holy Spirit uh, told me, is that we have, I even have our <laughs> props today. Props. The church is very good at discerning. Discerning means understanding. Discerning the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus paid for our salvation. It's what got us into heaven. It paid for our spiritual rebirth, the blood of Jesus. Okay. We literally, the blood of Jesus changed our entire spiritual um, nature. We no longer have a sin nature. If we sin, it's because of habits coming from our soul. It's not coming from our spirit. Okay. This is why. Paul said, I do what I don't, you know, and, and he said, when I sin, it's not even me sinning anymore. Ha, huh. look that up. Romans chapter seven. That's a pretty deep uh, statement. It's not me that sin anymore, but it's sin in me. So the blood of Jesus paid for our salvation and our new spirit, our new nature, the body of Jesus. Let's get some uh, elements here. This is not a plantain, Diane. This is actually <laughs> pita bread. The body of Jesus, look in Isaiah chapter 53. It says specifically the body was given for the healing of our body. So when we don't understand this, we're not appropriating God's will when we take communion. We're not aligning our soul, our thinking up with what he designed. So every time we take this, we're supposed to be thinking by his stripes, I am healed. Yes. My physical body is healed. Remember in Jewish thought, there's no such thing as, as spiritual healing, only physical healing. The spirit doesn't need healing. You have a, you have a perfect spirit. You right now have a perfect spirit. We're trying to take subjection. We're trying to take our body and subject it under the spirit. So our body looks like our spirit. Okay. That's the thing. That's the tension. That's the struggle. Putting our body under subjection of the spirit of God so that our body will get the correct messages, 100% truth. We will, in, we will have an ecosystem in our body where our cells can live forever. One day there's going to be a generation that does not die, according to Paul. But this body was supposed to be known to heal the physical body. The blood... It's about the spirit, the spiritual new, the new spirit. Okay. The body was broken for your physical well being. He took on sickness so that you could be healed. He became poor so that you could be rich. Hmm. He became poor. Yeah, on the cross, he became like a poor man. He died like a poor man so that you could be rich. He died like a sick man. He took stripes on his body. He took every pain, every sickness, every disease. He took it on his body so that your body, physical body, could be healed. And so when we don't understand, Paul said, they do not discern the body of Christ. They're not understanding why the body was so important. They always know about this. They're always, they drink the blood. They, they take communion. They know about that, but perhaps people were dying all around them who were saved and they were making up in their minds. Oh, it's not the will of God for us to be healed in our bodies 
Hmm. And they, they literally let death happen because they've accidentally embraced a wrong theology, right? They've accidentally, unintentionally embraced a death theology that we still die. You know that when we get death out of our thinking, I don't think death will, um, will happen anymore. I don't think there'll be such thing as death. Paul said, there's going to be a generation of people that don't die. Some people say, well, that's because of the rapture. They get raptured to heaven. I, again, you can disagree with me. Um, please ask the Holy spirit to, to talk to you about that. God designed Adam and Eve to live forever. His original design of you is forever to never die, to never experience death. He wanted you to habitate on earth and to, to go from earth to heaven, earth to heaven, the, the Jake, the ladder of Jacob, he, he designed you to to be in two places. I always just like to think of it simply too. What? Wasn't Jesus blood enough to pay for all of it? Mm. For, for You know? Yeah. For all of it. His body was enough. Yeah. Yeah. It was enough. We got to bring this back in. We got to bring the meaning and the understanding of this back to our thinking and our theology. But we've explained this away. We've mm-hmm. explained it away. We've gone, oh, but people still die. So this must not mean anything means everything it means everything for your health and your healing my friends now now again i just want to keep saying this don't be condemned don't take any condemnation if you have pain in your body or sickness it's not you my friends it's an attacker (laughs) don't be condemned or if you're struggling right now with something don't don't take any condemnation just ask the Lord about it. Just say, Lord, teach me more about that. Is, is what Annette's saying about the body, is, is it true? Uh, show me in the word, you know, go back to Isaiah 53, find out exactly what is blood paid for, what is body paid for. It tells you, right? And and also, um, I'm really analytical. And so like okay. when I get sick, I actually think like what thoughts have I been thinking? What atmosphere have I been living in? And if I go back into my life from when times I've been really sick, it has been times my mind has been really in the dumps, you know, Mm -hmm. or I've been crushed by my hope has been crushed or deferred hope or Mm -hmm. even just like, just basically everything boils down to fear or love. So I was operating heavily in the frequency of fear and then my body broke down and I got sick and that's happened like that. That's usually a clue. Can you share some healing testimonies from the healing rooms and impart a spirit of healing? Yes, Trish. Thank well, you. here's a testimony right here. Christy Grimm's uncle was healed from a cancer diagnosis after they prayed for him in the healing rooms. Yes. Okay. I do he have, a even few, there. have a few examples. Um, is that Christy's Chris, iPhone? Yeah. Oh, Christy okay. Grimm. Um, okay. I want to give you this, this one testimony. This might give you some wisdom. Okay. There is this woman um, that I knew from uh, my former church down in Orange County. Her husband started dying and no one knew why. All of a sudden, his body just started shutting down. She takes him to the emergency room. They put him in the hospital. And I'm trying to make a longer story short. Um, that's why I'm talking fast and I'm not giving you a lot of details. I'm only going to give you the important details here. But um, he goes into the ICU. His mom and his sister, they're Italians, they come in and the wife is just kind of watching and they come in and they start mourning that he's he's dying. The doctors say, we don't know why, but his body is shutting down. His organs are shutting down. He's going to be dead in not to in a few days, you know? And so his mom sits on the bed and she's crying and Oh, and mourning him and, and the sister is too. And they're just getting into this, this time of sadness. They're going to miss their, I mean, this is the natural response, right? I'm not trying to condemn this, but, but, but please hear me. The Holy spirit tells the wife, I want you to take your husband and take him home. And I want you to uh, not allow his mother and his sister to come over. And she goes, oh, wow, that's going to go over well (laughs) with them, these Italian women, right? 
she, she obeys God. She takes her husband home and the doctor said, you're crazy. He's going to, he's going to die. And she goes, well, you told me he's going to die in the hospital. So why doesn't he just, you know, I'm taking him home. You know, it made no sense, but so he, she takes him home and she literally, she's worshiping the Lord and she's, she's speaking over his body. Um, I don't know the specifics of what she did, but literally in a week, he was out of bed and he was healthy and whole. And he goes, do you want to know something? He tells his wife, he goes, I was in, when I was out of it in the hospital, he goes, it was really weird. He goes, but every time my mom came to see me and my sister, this little fuzzy furry creature would get on my bed and it would crawl up and it was real cuddly, like a fuzzy, cuddly creature. It would come and it would run up my chest and it would be right here. And it would, it would be so soft and cuddly. And I could feel like life was being sucked out of me. Oh my. And he goes, when you brought me home, that creature never came and visited me anymore. And I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. So then that takes me to the story of Jesus throwing the mourners out. Why does he throw the mourners out? We're supposed to mourn with those who mourn. My friends, this is the thing. We, if we're going to carry the atmosphere of heaven, then we are going to have to have a different response to circumstances on the earth than what our feelings and emotions want to respond, right? I have one more testimony, Robin, and I hope you can stay on because I want to get to your question. Um, one more testimony here in regards to atmosphere, because I believe this woman created an atmosphere of truth around her husband and he was able to heal. Okay, so one day on Christmas day, my husband and I are out sledding with our little cousin and out in the mountains, it's Christmas day a few years ago, and we get a phone call from some students from Bethel School of Supernatural Medicine. Uh, uh, medicine. <laughs> <Ministry>. <laughs> yeah, it is medicine. <laughs> and he, my friend, and he goes, Annette, he goes, no one is available from the healing rooms. And my friend is in the hospital. He's dying. We need someone to come and pray for him. Can you come? Can you and Mike come, please? So we're like, Yes, we left the mountain right away and we came down and we went to the hospital and we walk in the hospital, my friends, and we don't know this kid that's dying. The kid that's dying was 21 years old, very young. And um, he had been on some kind of medicine. It caused cancer in his body. Um, and he literally had only a few hours to live. Okay, this was the diagnosis. And he, he was from another country. And his friend or his uh, mom and dad flew in on Christmas Day to say goodbye to their son, who was attending the supernatural school of ministry. How crazy, right? So they they come in, they're they're in the hospital room with their son. We Mike and I walk into the hospital, and there are all these students, there must have been 20 or 30 lining the the uh hallway <laughs> lining the hallway they're on the floor crying and i have no emotional attachment to this kid i don't even i've never seen him i've never met him so i didn't get caught up in the emotion of it right i'm just going in there to heal this kid that that was my 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 I focus see. right so i i go in and i'm like oh my goodness and the lord says this is not the right atmosphere for healing and all of a sudden, this, this, these words came out of my mouth and I go, you guys get up right now. And I want you to celebrate every breath he takes right now. He is not dead. He's alive. I want you to get up and I want you to dance. I want to turn on some music and we're going to celebrate every breath he takes because yeah. every breath he takes is right from God. It is a God moment. And we're going to celebrate God right now. Come on. So we all go into the waiting room and I turn on Kim Walker Smith and we're just like, we, I mean, they, they told me later, they were so mad at me, <laughs> but I was laughing so hard after that. But anyways, the we started dancing. At you? Yeah. Some of the students were like, we're not going to worship, right? We're not going to dance right now. Is she crazy? I mean, our friend is dying. Right. And, um, so we're dancing, we are, we're singing and the doctor comes in and he goes, he had told us, I am not going to helicopter him into, uh, UC Davis because he's a lot 
the helicopter ride will kill him. So there was literally no hope. And the doctor comes in and he goes, uh, we're able to, I think we're gonna helicopter him to UC Davis down in San Francisco. And I'm just like, wow, something happened. Something broke, you know? So Mike and I, we go into the room now where his parents are and he is dying on the bed. And I just start talking to the parents and I start telling them a different story. I just literally just hope was coming out of my mouth. And both of them, their their countenance totally changed. They were just like, they both started sitting up taller. And long story short, we go to San Francisco and we stayed there for five days praying and declaring and worshiping and it. And every day the diagnosis would change. A doctor would come in and say, well, we thought it was this kind of cancer, but it's actually this, it's not as invasive as we thought. It's that every day the diagnosis would change to something better. Well, by Thursday that week, he was up and he walked out of the hospital, my friends. And the Lord told me, the Lord told me, if he goes home, he will die. Keep him in Reading, keep him in hope, keep him in an atmosphere of joy, of celebration. And his desire was to live. His desire was to graduate first year BSSM. That, that's all he wanted was to stay. And his parents made him go home because then they were afraid. They were afraid that he would, he would stoop back down and blah, 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 like any parent. He got totally healed, my friends. The doctor said, well, he has this percentage of cancer still in his cells, not in the need of any chemotherapy or radiation, but guess what? They still gave it to him. He died six months later on the day of BSSM graduation. Oh, wow. My friends, atmosphere is so important. Atmosphere of hope is so important. Now, I do not condemn those parents. They got into fear. Um, they didn't have a lot of uh, uh, faith-filled friends to surround them. And, and there's no condemnation. And this guy is alive and he's in heaven and he goes on, he's going to live for a bazillion years, right? No condemnation. But my friends, th I'm just trying to show you the importance of the atmosphere you're walking in. The importance of the atmosphere you're creating around you. You can get someone out from their, their, their off their deathbed. Mm. When the doctor said there was no way he was leaving this hospital, he did twice. He left to go to San Francisco and he walked out of San Francisco's hospital healed and healthy. So my friends, don't get, don't get um, down when you watch this Johnson uh -huh. uh, episode, go like this when you're watching. Da, 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 da. Okay. Uh, okay, we have another question. Uh, Robin, are you still there? You had a question. Did you ask it over here? I believe it's God's will to heal. How do I reconcile when I have faith for someone to be healed and know God wants it too, but the healing doesn't happen for that person? Um, that's a very, very good question for the Holy Spirit. Um, <laughs> because most likely uh, that the situation that you're talking about is um, there's there's some details in that situation that the Holy Spirit wants you to pay attention to. Um, perhaps you've heard that friend of yours say something like, um, well, if it's God's will, he'll heal me. Up. Heal me. That's the moment that you say, it's never if it's God's will, it's always God's will. You know, let's clear up, let's clean up our thinking, let's clean up our, um, our theology. When we don't pray, if it's your will, God, heal me. No, Jesus prayed that in the garden for a different purpose. It was not about whether God's will is to heal or no, it was about going to the cross. That was the only way for Jesus to win uh, back the keys of the kingdom for us. He had to go to the cross. So he's like thinking uh, about the anguish he's going to have to go through. Is it your will? If it, it let this cup pass from me, he, that, he's not talking about healing here. 
He's talking about something totally different. It's always God's will to heal someone. It's always God's will for them to walk in uh, divine health on earth. Just because they don't ex uh, experience it doesn't mean it's not God's will. And they're not condemned if they don't figure it out on this side of eternity. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are all on a journey to knowing more and more about the body of Jesus, the precious body of Jesus broken for our healing. And we're going from faith to faith the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the perfecter because we don't have perfect faith yet. <laughs> he is still perfecting us. So um, Robin, I know I didn't really answer that, but you can still uh, guide that person in um, a journey of more faith. Get Speak life over them. Speak hope. Keep telling them what the word says. Tell them to get into the word and search God's heart. What is God saying about your, um, this problem, you know, get them to asking, get them in front of Jesus, get them to ask the Holy spirit, these hard questions, because the Holy spirit wants to show them the answer. He wants so bad to say like in Ma Matthew 13 to give you progressively more revelation until you have more than enough. I he guess I, cause I have to run. So I want to, okay. I may have to check the chat, but okay. I guess cause I've always heard Bill and others say, just like, it only takes one person. Like it does, it's not their faith that's lacking. Is it my faith then? No, because no. I have the faith. Why it's, it's not about them speaking negatively over their life. Right. Robin, you know what? It's never about uh, you having enough faith. Be, the, okay. You're growing in your faith. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. But, but think of it this way, God, or Jesus tells, um, remember, remember when the disciples couldn't get the guy healed and they're like, oh, they're like, why couldn't we do it? You know? And then, and then Jesus comes on and, and the, the father of the son says, um, I believe, but help me with my doubt. You know? So he acknowledges, I believe you, Jesus, but I've got doubts help like, take away my doubt. And Jesus says, have the God kind of faith. He says, have God faith. Okay. You don't have faith from yourself. The faith that you have is given to you by God. It's God's faith. That's working in you. It's his faithfulness. That's working in you. So you never have to conjure up your own faith. You never have to go looking for more faith in yourself. What what's happening is the Lord is saying, Keep asking me, keep getting in front of me because my faith is going to transfer to you. My faith, my faith is going to be what heals your friend, right? So um, we have this thing in healing rooms that we say faith doesn't look at itself to find enough power in itself. It looks at the one they have faith in. We look to Jesus. Jesus is the faith we need. So keep getting in front of Jesus, the Robin. Author. You probably have. You, you've probably done everything that you know to do. Get your friend in front of Jesus, asking him, Lord, teach me about that. Teach me about this. Why? Why? Um, you don't really even have to ask the why question. A lot of people say, don't ask God the why question. Ask him, teach me what I need to know today. Because if you say, teach me what I need to know today, it keeps you present. Okay. If you ask the big picture, why question, what happens is it takes you out of this personal relationship, face-to-face -face encounter with God that you need for today. And today she needs to be face-to-face -face with Jesus. So it, we, we refrain from saying, why do I have cancer to God, teach me what I need to know about this today, you know, and he'll start giving you seeds of wisdom to take authority over the sickness and over the disease. He'll, he'll give you, he'll give you little bits of revelation that will help clear up some mind things that are going on or some attitudes or some words that have been spoken and, or he wants you to take authority over something that's been spoken 
at you, against you, and it's still kind of out there talking to you, impersonating Jesus, or, you know, telling you, you're this, you're that, get rid of those voices. There's something that God wants to say to you today. So get her in front of Jesus today, you know? Okay. Um, you know, okay, we love you, Robin. Love you, Robin. Thanks for coming. We love you. We love you. Love you. <laughs> okay. What any other questions? Um, she's the power of the words, a story to shape belief and atmosphere. Yes. Yes, Sarah. It's always a um, okay. It's always God's will. Why did Jesus step past the other people at the pool of Bethesda? Very good question. Who answered that? Or asked that. That was Constance. Okay. That uh, he stepped over those people. Now, do you remember? Um, remember, Paul says in in one verse. I don't know what verse exactly it is, but he goes. It could have been Peter in Acts. He goes. He saw that they had the faith to be healed. He could literally see that there was faith present on these people, on, on this person's face or this group of people to be healed, and it was. These people had an open heart. Perhaps it is. Now, this is only speculation because the word does not tell us. So mm -hmm. we are just asking the Holy Spirit at this time, what about that? What about all the other people that were there at the pool of Bethesda? Why didn't they get healed? Perhaps Jesus walked in and he saw one person who had an open heart. I don't know. Because God doesn't force healing on people. He doesn't. He doesn't force salvation on them. He saw someone had an open heart and he went over there and he said, what do you want? That's a weird question to ask someone who's been lame for 13 years. I don't know. How many years was it? 30 so years, 30 years. That is more what do you want? Sarah. He needed, he wanted that man to tell him what he wanted, his desire of his heart. Some people remain sick because they love the attention that it gives them they don't even know that's why but it's it's a it's almost like an identity you know it becomes their identity accidentally unintentionally but it does over time they've been sick for so long that it becomes just something that they put up with and something they they don't even fight against anymore okay again no condemnation but this is, this is what happens. And so we don't know. We can only assume that that is what happened. And we can only assume because the Bible doesn't tell us. We don't know. Did Jesus maybe go back and heal? The, uh, the Bible says that Jesus did so many things that all of the books in the entire world could not hold all that Jesus did in his three years of ministry. So I wonder if he went back and healed the rest of them. I don't know. It's not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. It was 38 years. 38 years. So we can only assume. Yeah, I don't really have a question for that or a, an answer for that. But you do want to ask the Holy Spirit about that, Constance. Anyone else? You got a, any questions? I know a lot of answers, you guys. Come on, give me some questions. Um. But the Holy Spirit has all the answers and you have the Holy Spirit, which is cool. You can ask him anything that you want. You know, he's wanting to answer your questions. Sometimes I realize in my own life that I'm not answering the right or I'm not asking the right question. Did someone ever ask you like a question in the healing rooms and you were like, oh. uh, like oh. I'm sure I think it happened a few times. Because I have, like I said, I've, I've been studying this for 20 years in the Bible, in the <laughs> word. And I think I have gotten a question like that before. But you know what? I always just say, go ask the Holy Spirit about something that you don't understand. I do have another question that I can pose myself in regards to the chosen scene. What do you believe happened versus what they portrayed? Um, that didn't happen. Uh, that scene didn't happen. It was never um, none of his disciples, uh, as far as I know, I could be wrong about that, Trish. Um, yeah, yeah, that whole scene did not, did not happen. What do you believe happened versus what they portrayed? Do you want to get on Trish and ask the question? 
My sister with CP had the desire to be healed. She died of 30. Um, apparently, she wasn't enough. I just celebrated her eighth anniversary of leaving me for Jesus. We can talk later. That's a big cue. Mm. Yes. Okay, Trish, you're going to ask. What did okay. you mean by that? Uh, well, I'm just curious. Um, I don't know a lot about that about that scene. I don't know a lot about little James and his life. I don't know if he was actually crippled. I don't know. I don't know enough about that. So I was wondering if you knew more about okay. the specifics of that. Like, was he actually crippled and was never healed, or was he crippled and got healed? Like, no. I, he, I just he wasn't. Know. The Bible doesn't say that he was crippled. So they might have introduced that as a point of interest in a character that actually wasn't yeah. biblical. I'm yeah. going to look into that more. I'm really curious now. Yeah. yeah. One of the things I really appreciate about what you've done is even though, at least speaking for myself, like I love The Chosen. I love, they're doing such an incredible yeah. job, Yeah. but it's a good reminder that they are human and they might err and they might portray something that has some, some Job in there that has some faulty beliefs yeah. that are popular in the church. Like it's good to just keep using discernment and yeah. have an open heart, but a discerning spirit at the same time. It's a really good reminder. Yeah. yeah but we've, I'm just keep declaring this. We've entered into a new age in the church, mm -hmm. which when this new age comes new theology. So my prayer for that is yes, that it only makes like a huge spotlight on it. And yeah, that, and it illuminates that dark, dark place of theology, and that people begin to question it more than ever. I love that because there's so many people in the theaters like us who were like, "This is wrong. This is wrong," mm -hmm. and that thought goes out, you know, like a frequency, you know, yeah. revelation. Yeah, and out. and there were a lot of people also really embracing that scene. They were crying. It was emotionally amazing. And I don't mean good. Mm -hmm. um, in, in that, it helps people come up with their own thought to justify why their mother died or their or why they're not healed of cancer. But it's a dangerous theology. It's like the man who had the the comfortable little creature. Mm -hmm. it, it was comfortable, but it was sucking the life right out of them. Mm -hmm. And, um, and this is why Jesus had to get the mourners out of there. He, you know, he, he, you're creating this atmosphere of embracing sickness. Um, you're embracing an enemy, you know, when you do that, um, anyways, so it's a, it's, it was the most dangerous, uh, scene, uh, theologically because it helps people to partner with a work of the devil. And we're supposed to trample the works of the devil. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and one, I mean, just one of the simple things that we do, and I think I mentioned this, is we take the sickness or the disease and we make it part of us because we've had it for a long time or we struggled with it a long time. Again, you are a healed person that's been attacked mm -hmm. by an enemy force. You're not a, you're not a sick person trying to get healed. You're healed already, but you're being attacked by a sickness. The sickness doesn't belong to you. And this is part of that getting in front of Jesus and asking him, what do I need to know today? Did I say something like I have cancer? No, no, no. I don't have cancer. I have Jesus and cancer is attacking me. And so I'm going to take authority over you cancer today. And today I'm going to rebuke you. I'm going to, you know, so this is the thing. This is the daily abiding in God, daily abiding in the truth to, to uh, implement force, the force of heaven against our enemy to subdue. We started this day off talking about subduing. And, and Paul saying, I have to put my body under subjection of my spirit because my spirit man was supposed to be in charge, not my body in charge of my spirit, mm -hmm. not my body telling my spirit what the truth is, my spirit telling my mind, will, and emotions and my body, the truth. And remember your body responds to truth. Your body responds to the presence of God to the word of God, 
The word of God is truth, 100% truth to the tree of life, life only, not the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but only life. And I, and I think I said that when we get the death culture, the death mindset out of our mind completely to the point where we, when someone says someone died, we're like, what's that died? What's death? <laughs> Do you, this is where God wants us to be one day where we have no knowledge of evil. We were never meant to have knowledge of or experience evil. Sickness is evil. And because you've been attacked by sickness doesn't make you an evil person. It means you're being attacked. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God being attacked by an enemy. And when you treat that like an enemy, you'll start taking force. You will start subduing. You will start conquering. You'll start acting like more than a conqueror. Mm -hmm. And that's what God is hoping for. If you don't on this side of eternity, you're still going to heaven. But he really wants heaven to come to earth through you. What can you speak to like personal responsibility um, along with that in healing? And I'm meaning that specifically like say, for example, somebody gets a radical healing from some type of a disease or cancer or whatever it may be. And um, six months later, the sickness is coming back like mm -hmm knowing this is half question, half statement, like this is my thought, but I, I want to also hear yours on this to, you know, if you have anything um, that I'm missing, which is probably true, <laughs> especially given your experience there. Um, so like, for example, if we get a radical, we have a radical miraculous healing and we get sick again, because we have Holy Spirit, we can say, Holy Spirit, is it something spiritual that's allowing this thing to continue to bind onto me spiritually? Or is there is there mold in my home? Right. Is there a, a toxin that I'm that I'm eating? Is there a food? You know, is there a person? Is there what else is in my life that right. I can take responsibility for and remove so that right. I'm not just, you know, relying on the spiritual, but what's my part to partner with God right. through yeah. divine wisdom and revelation? So what what do you think about that? Well, I think you're right on right there, because um, you think, uh, think of the verse that everything that's seen was made from the unseen, right? So mold and, and everything was made from the unseen. Whenever there's something bad or toxic in our food or in our atmosphere, it came from the unseen, but I can assure you it did not come from the father. It is a distortion of what the father has made and God or uh, the enemy has has uh, has uh, contaminated what God meant for good, right? And so when the Lord tells you, you've got mold in your house, he's giving mm -hmm. you wisdom against the enemy. The enemy is going to attack you any way he can, whether he can get you to kill you or he can come in the form of mold, whatever. None of that is from the Lord, mm -hmm. right? But God is trying to give you wisdom to take, he, to subdue the physical world, to put the world under subjection to the father's will. So we remove mold, <laughs> just like we would remove bad thoughts, right? It is, I believe the, the physical existence is uh, all about the spirit, all about the spirit, because God, or Jesus was trying to show his disciples that you you've heard that it said long ago that if you have if you commit adultery with a woman then you're guilty but i say that a thought of having a, a adulterous relationship is just as bad why because everything that happens in the physical realm first starts in the spirit now your spirit is not an evil spirit but you have an evil one that is coming and trying to get you to move according to it instead of according to your spirit so everything can be taken back to a spiritual source right this is why it says in romans chapter four or five that the faith of Abraham was like Jesus who calls things that be not as though they are. Why do we call things that be not as though they are? Because God wants you to be back into your original design of calling things um, the way Adam called them in the garden. 
He framed up the world with his words. He wants you to walk in the same authority that he gave Adam. He wants you to walk in the same um, oh, sonship. He wants you to be like him, right? He wants you to walk in the same authority as Jesus walked in. He wants you to have the same, not even Jesus was uh, able to heal people. Do you remember that one story? What stopped his healing, my friends? Do you remember? You know what I'm talking about? When he went to his own hometown, he, it, the Bible says he could there do no mighty work. Why? It, the, the Bible's talking about ability. When it says the word could, it's talking about ability, not willing, not, not his will. It wasn't his, it didn't say he would hear, uh, he would not heal them. That would have to do with the will of the father. He could there do no mighty work. It was because of their unbelief. So we do have this partnership where it's not based on our faith. It's based on the father's faith, but the father's faith is in us. So we need to remember that it is, uh, there is a belief system that we partner with. There's a lot of things um, that Jesus showed us a lot of mystery um, around all of the subject, but it's, but it is amazing to discover it, to get in front of Jesus every day and say, teach me more about that. God, you know, what about this? Did you see that? How did that happen? Tell me a secret about that. Lord, I want to be able to teach others how to subdue, how to subdue their life, how to subdue the earth, how to bring all things under subjection to the father, to father's love. Any other questions, you guys, before we take off? There's so many of them. I do have one question that I can pose if you guys don't have one. It's the verse where the disciples are asking Jesus, who sinned, the boy's father or the boy's mother? They're trying to find a source yeah. of this, this kid's uh, blindness. And Jesus says, well, neither his father or his mother but for the glory of God, I, I'm going to heal the, this kid. I, I'm not saying that perfectly, but you guys know what verse I'm talking about. Okay, so do you know that the Bible contained in the original manuscripts no punctuation, no periods, no um, uh, commas, nothing. In that verse, a comma was added. Neither his father or his mother sinned, but so that I can do the works of my father, you know, he, he goes on to heal him, right? So people take that verse and go, oh, so God gave him the blindness so that he could heal him one day and bring glory to God. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. If you put a period after that part, was it his father or his mother that made him blind? Period. And, and Jesus says, neither, period. Neither of them, period. Now, next paragraph. But so you can see the works of God, I'm going to heal him right now. That's how it should be read. Okay, so that the Holy Spirit showed me that. You ask him about that verse and ask him if I got it right, if I heard the Holy Spirit right. You guys need to ask him about that verse. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Jesus meant. And I think that's the how it originally was heard. Because if he said, see, see, God never goes against his own will. So you know that the um that when they're on the boat and the storm and he calms the storm. Was did God send that storm? Does God stop his own storms that he sends? No, that storm was started by the demonic. And I believe that it was started by the demons that Jesus was coming to subdue. He was coming across the lake to get that man, Legion, healed and delivered of all of those demons. And the demons saw Jesus coming across the lake and they caused a storm, a violent storm. And Jesus rebuked the storm and calmed it. See, it wasn't God's will for that storm to be happening. And so God rebukes it, right? God doesn't rebuke his own doing. <laughs> he doesn't start a storm 
to show off to you and to stop it. Jesus never went against the father's will. The father's will was not to create that storm. The demonic started it. Okay. Jesus, God's never given you a disease to prove something ever. He doesn't use the tools of Satan to prove something to you. No, never. Okay. Someone had, oh, he let him stay blind until I was there to heal his blindness. <clears> hmm. <throat> okay. So a lot of people talk about the, uh, um, God, well, they'll say this, they'll say, uh, well, God didn't give me this disease, but sorry, excuse me. Uh, God didn't give me this disease, but he, um, it's like he tolerated. What's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. God, um, it's like God hasn't healed me. So he, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You guys, you can help me here. Um, he didn't enable it. He is allowing looking, it. He allowed it. Yes. That's the word I was looking for. He's allowing this disease in my body. Let me tell you, friends, God disallowed sickness and disease on the cross. He disallowed it. His final judgment was on the cross and he disallowed sickness and disease. It, it, it's this brokenness in this disconnect between our realm and his. And if we pursue the kingdom of God, all of these things will be added to us. It's all about the governing system mm -hmm. of God mm -hmm. having its way in your body, having its way in your atmosphere, in your, in your families, in your life. It, it, it's letting God come through you, his governing system to come through you. And it won't be all in one day because you're still getting in front of Jesus. You're still abiding in him. You're still learning how to abide in him all day long. And, and what did Jesus say? When you abide in me, you can ask anything and the father will give it to you. It's about abiding. How many of us perfectly abide every day? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> do, you, do you know anyone that's perfectly doing that yet? No, <laughs> but my goodness, my heart is too. But if I don't get rid of distractions and I don't get rid of the wrong thoughts and I don't get rid of the wrong theologies and I don't come against the wrong thinking, who will? Who will stand up? to the wrong theologies that are leading people straight to their destruction and straight to a life on the earth that's going to be cut off sooner than God had planned. Who's going to stand up and stop it? We have to, because there's an ever increase of his government of peace. Remember, peace means wholeness, health, healing, yeah. shalom. His government of peace, shalom. That means all things made right. Righteousness is that. All things made right. They're not all right right now. People are still dying. But God's will is for everything to receive his righteousness. This is what God wants on earth. He doesn't want destruction. He doesn't want the earth to go to hell in a handbasket. He doesn't want us waiting around for the rapture. He wants us subduing the earth. <laughs> he wants us to increase in our knowledge of him. He wants us to increase in the government of peace, letting the God. This is why he said the kingdom is, of God is within you. And then he said, work out your salvation. Your salvation is in here. You have it already. You have everything that you need. You have every key of the kingdom. Now work it out. Let it come out. Let it come out of your mouth. Let it come out of your being, out of the presence of who you are. Let it become out in joyful praise. Do you know God commands us to praise him? Why? Hundreds of times in the Psalms. He doesn't suggest praise. He commands it. Do you know why? He commands you to praise him because your praise affects the atmosphere around you. Yes. 
This is why in the healing rooms, we start off with gratitude. We pray and we thank Jesus for what he's doing right now. Because if we're not thanking him, we're looking at the problem that we have to solve. People coming into the healing rooms with cancer, people coming in with crutches and in their wheelchairs. When we get into this language of gratitude and we start praying what we're thankful for, the tiniest little things, we bring on the presence of God and we're speaking out our mouth praise and we enter his courts with praise and thanksgiving. We enter into the presence of God when we praise and we thank him. And we're bringing him on this scene and he's teaching us something for today. And tomorrow, we're going to do the same thing over again. We're going to learn to abide in him and never leave his presence. One day, all of us will walk like Adam and Eve. We will have so much glory around us that we could walk around naked. Because (laughs) you start first, (laughs) the glory of God surrounds us with so and you can't even see it's like we're we're we are clothed in this righteousness <laughs> i'll be the first but <laughs> you just tell diane me. will join you. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta tell me if you can see through the glory or not <laughs> annette's new clothes <laughs> oh my goodness yeah to bring it I don't know if you're yeah, finished. Yeah, we, I was going to sew it up for you. I'm sewing. I'm hours. like, it's two. I'm going to sew it up. <laughs> sew it up. Um, I was going to sew it up. And this is what I was thinking, just to bring it full circle back around where we started. Um, you know, just like, how do we abide? How do we abide all the time? And it's just awareness, just turning our affection to him. So let's all just do that real quick. And just yeah, put our I'm hands gonna, on our chest oh, and so say, this. oh, but you're here. Oh, but you're here, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Oh, but you're here. Mm-hmm. We thank you, God, for all of this heavy revy from Annette <laughs> that it would set in our hearts and we would um, know the truth and the truth would set us free and our families free and all around us free. Now that this year ahead and this last month or so ahead of us would be marked by freedom. Mm-hmm. And we thank you, Jesus. We thank you that you're here, Lord. And we just bless our sanctified imaginations to partner with you all day long that we're imagining the best. Close yeah. your eyes and imagine the best that could happen. Close your eyes and imagine the best. All your dreams coming true now, much more than you imagine. Close your eyes and imagine the best. Yeah, I encourage you, friends, to go into the throne room in your imagination. Go, I see, I see, okay. I see. So, go yeah. into your throne room in your imagination. Bring those requests before God. Bring those those things. And when you when you cannot figure it out, when you're leaning on your own understanding, oh, but you're here. Mm. And then feel free to that <laughs> came right. rev it up. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you want to lead us in the okay. So we're gonna take okay. communion really fast, my friends. By his stripes, you were healed. Yes. Two thousand years ago, the price was paid. Your body was given the power of healing two thousand years ago. And every time you feel pain, my friends, remind your body. That by your stri- by his stripes you were healed, and so because of that pain you have to go in Jesus' name. Sickness and disease you must go now. I will not tolerate you in my body. For Jesus paid with his own body, and he gave me his life. In Jesus' name, take it and receive, my friends, healing from Jesus. And remember, my friends, that the blood of Jesus Mm -hmm. is yours. You are grafted in. You're a true son and a true daughter. He grafted you in. His blood is now your blood. That's great. (laughs) His blood is working its way through your body 
and changing your very DNA. Your DNA is being changed by the blood of Jesus. Your spirit is going to live forever because of this. Your old nature is dead and gone. You died with Christ and you also raised with him. You don't have your old nature anymore. That old nature is dead and gone. Thank goodness. His blood was enough for you. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. It's a love feast. It's a love feast. To life, to life, lachayim. It's a love feast to a, a king who is alive, not to a dead. It's not a memorial to a dead king. It's a life feast to a risen king, Jesus. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I love it. Did you drink all of it? Uh, uh. <laughs> okay, my friends. I love you. Is it grape and juice? No. I Is it real wine? Have- yes. <laughs> It's real wine. So she's like, it's the middle of the day. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Okay, we're going to go off our recording. Thank you for bearing with me and hanging in there. There's so much to learn, but you have the Holy Spirit. You don't need Annette Biggers. You don't need Melissa Dietrich. Well, I do, but but (laughs) you have the Holy Spirit, my friends. You have the teacher of all teachers. You have Jesus. Just ask him. He'll tell you. Ask him what you need to know today. Abide in him so that whatever you ask, the Father will give you. I love you. Love you. You stop my recording.